Amazon. Yep. That's good. Is right here? Okay. You'll have to follow me. So we are live streaming this, so everybody needs to watch their language, please. My mother's watching, so everybody really needs to watch their language. So we'll just give it about another three minutes and we can begin. Well, I'm glad to see this is such an interesting topic for everybody. It's always good. A confusing topic, but a good one. You could still talk for three minutes. We've got some time. Again, please get donuts and cider so I don't have to take them home with me, please. So you can go to uh, St. Mary, you can go to YouTube. It's being live streamed on YouTube. So youtube.com and then in the search bar type in St. Mary Magdalene, Fenton, Michigan and our page will pop up. There'll be a picture of our church. And if you open up our page, it'll be one of the first videos. It says lecture one live and then you'll be able to watch it. YouTube.com and then type in St. Mary Magdalene, in the search bar, St. Mary Magdalene, Fenton, Michigan. And our page should show up. And then you can, you can, um, you can see the video. And for those that are watching online, it's going to be hard to see the, the slideshow and, and kind of follow along. But uh, the study guide that everybody here has physically is available on our website, which is st Mary Magdalene, ending with an E, dot org. And then you go to our ministries page, adult education, and it's, it's the study guide is available for download in there. So you could follow along because we are going to be doing some reading from the Chronicles of Narnia, the first book, The Magician's Nephew. Uh, we're going to pull from we're going to pull a couple different things from that tonight to help us understand the beginning. So that'll be in there, and I think we could probably just start now. And those that are late are late. So again, welcome to our first class on the beginning and the end. Like I said, I'm really glad that this is a very popular topic, and and I'm glad we all were able to make it. Hopefully, uh, next week, if you're able to come and join us for Compline before the service or before the uh, before the class, that'd be wonderful to have all of us begin this with prayer. But for those of you that are unable, that's okay too. I realize that a lot of people get off late after work. I want to start with a couple questions because I think these four questions are probably some of the questions that priests get asked the most, especially by non-Orthodox. So these are very popular questions that people will look. If they see a guy in a cassock, they'll run up to him and they'll ask him one of these questions. There are more questions that he'll ask, like, why are you wearing a black dress? But these are like more of the deeper questions that they will ask. So let's look at a couple of these. And we're going to try to answer some of these throughout the course of this class. So number one, if God is all loving, why does he allow bad things to happen to good people? How many have ever been asked this question? Lots of you. If you want the answer to this, I'm sorry, it's not going to be covered in this class. I just wanted to think of a very difficult question that the priests would be asked. We do have a metanoia class, so we talk about theodicy. Uh, that's available throughout the year, so we'll cover that in a different class. But here's the three that I really want to touch on. Here's the next one. What is the purpose in our lives? Why am I here? Why was I born? What's going to happen to me after I die? I always laugh when our last metanoia class is always on the funeral service and death. So the, the catechumens that are coming into the church, the last class that they learn is on the funeral service and death. And regardless of when I have that class, it could be a blizzard outside. That's like the most popular class. I have so many people at that class who want answers to this question, what is going to happen to me after I die? So that's a very difficult one to answer as well. And then finally, what do you believe about the end times? So I always am asked, are you, do you believe in the rapture? 
Where are the babies? Where are the babies? Remember, from those of you that came from a, a church that had rapture theology. And all of the questions are very polarizing, and they have been heavily debated by modern Christian scholars over the last several hundred years, really over the last several thousand years. And the results, especially with that last one, what do we believe about the end times? The rapture will take place two weeks after. We'll talk about the rapture in a couple weeks, yes. Kind of. We'll talk about the rapture. But that last one, one could say that that last one is probably, the, probably one of the reasons why we have 30,000 different churches that all believe different things about the end times and some of the answers to these questions. And if having 30,000 different views wasn't enough, we're also hit with things like this. In our modern society, we have all of these images that we see in newspapers and in television in our own secular society that try to answer these questions in their own ways. And they give us kind of some funny ideas about things like heaven and hell. I know this is hard to see, but that first one, it's showing heaven going up and hell going down. And the husband is looking at a sign with the hardware store going upstairs and women's shoes going downstairs. <laughs> And then, of course, the, the vision of heaven uh, where the, it says no atheists and the guy standing in front of the, uh, the angels saying, I don't believe it. No atheists allowed. And then the other one is a married couple who must have passed away together waiting to get into heaven and says, but I only agreed until death do us part. That's a, <laughs> we don't believe that as Orthodox Christians. It's eternity. We don't have until de death do you part. You never hear that. But heaven and hell, I think that one is probably the one that's most polarizing. It's the one that these images pop up in people's heads to try to describe what heaven and hell is like, and we believe none of them. I think sometimes people think that heaven is going to be this place where we're all going to go up and we're going to lay on a hammock, and we're going to be eating grapes or playing croquet with each other, and Jesus is there somewhere. You know, this is kind of like the vision of heaven and hell is this place filled with high hell, fire, and brimstone where we're getting whipped by the devil and, or we have like our least favorite television show on rerun that we have to watch all over and over and over for eternity. But there's so much confusion out in society today. But one of the ways we could sort through some of this confusion is by doing what you're here, doing here today. By looking at the ancient Christian understanding of these questions and the answers that so many are seeking. So with God's help, this is what we're going to be covering today and, to, and next week we're going to be covering the study of cosmology. Have we all heard this word before? Cosmology. It's the study of the beginning of the world, creation. So that'll be the first two weeks. Today we're going to talk about uh, physical creation. Next week we'll talk about the non-physical creation, so angels. We're going to talk about time and various things. And then the third class we'll be talking about uh, our study of, of the end times and heaven, on, he heaven and hell. And then hopefully, God willing, His Eminence will be with us on November 6th uh, on that last Wednesday to talk about uh, the Last Judgment with all of you. And all of those really difficult questions you want to ask me, save for Him <laughs> on that last, very, very last class. Because uh, He will be with us. That's the study of eschatology. Yes? Father, uh, I've been a Christian for over 20 some odd years. And I have a very strong interest in the end times and all that stuff. Why is it so difficult to find books that I could have read to answer some of these questions? So the question was, why isn't there a lot written about the end times and orthodox books that are available for it? There are. Ask me that question on the third class. Because okay. today we're not going to talk so much about the end times. Today we have to start at the beginning. Who has read anything by C.S. Lewis in this room? Thank God. I'm so glad. Who has ever read the series that we're going to be looking at throughout this class, The Chronicles of Narnia. Who has read it in the past five years? Some of you? Good. Very good. So I hope that everybody has read C.S. Lewis. He is a wonderful Christian author. We're going to be talking a lot about C.S. Lewis during this class. He has written many incredibly thought-provoking books that are beloved by Christians, not just Orthodox, but also many other Christians throughout the world. But his most famous works the ones that have sold over 100 million copies since they came out are this series of the Chronicles of Narnia. Now, for those of you that have not read the Chronicles of Narnia, it's not a prerequisite for this course to go through these books or to even remember a lot about the books. But just so you know, as a quick overview of what these books were about, 
So these seven, this seven books, book series takes us into this parallel universe called Narnia. Okay? And it's full of magic, it's full of mystical beasts, it's full of talking animals. And the book, all of the books, go through the adventures of various children who go there from this world and they play pivotal roles in the history and development of Narnia over there. And throughout the books, they're led by a talking lion whose name is Aslan, yes, who shows up in the books to protect Narnia from the forces of evil. So this is a very quick overview of what this Chronicles of Narnia series was. And although C.S. Lewis mentions in all of his memoirs, he says, you know, I did not write these books to quote psychologically ingrain Christian understanding in children. You really can't read through the Chronicles of Narnia, especially if you have a seminary degree, or especially if you come to church often and take classes like this often. You cannot read through the Chronicles of Narnia without seeing some incredible allegorical references to major Christian themes and doctrine. So I wanted to do a quick quiz to test your memory of the series of the Chronicles of Narnia. I'm going to go through four of these, five of these. And I want to see if you could tell me what the theme of the book is from a Christian understanding or one of the major allegorical references in it. So let's start with the one we're going to talk about today. What do you think the magician's nephew is about? What theme does, what Christian theme do we see in the magician's nephew? Any? Creation, very easy. This is a very easy one. Yes, creation. <laughs> creation and also whoop, how evil entered into Narnia. We get this in the, at the, towards the end of the book in The Magician's Nephew. What about the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe? I'll give you a hint on this one. It has to do with Aslan. What is the major theme in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? What major Christian events are kind of covered in this book? The crucifixion and the resurrection. This is an amazing, amazing scene. If you read it and you understand scripture, where Aslan literally sacrifices himself for the heirs of Edmund on a stone, which splits into two, and then he's resurrected later. C.S. Lewis said, oh, that's just a coincidence. But it's pretty, pr pretty, pretty amazing to think about. So Prince Caspian, this takes place centuries after The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And if you remember, I, I was trying to think of probably the most prominent theme, because there were a couple. But you remember that in that book, everything that had happened to Aslan and the children from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe had happened centuries before. You remember this? And everybody thought that that was all folklore, kind of like what we deal with today. Well, Scripture is just a story. It's a tale, right? It doesn't have any truth into it. The horse and his boy, this is another hard one, so I didn't, I didn't want to quiz you on this one, but it has a lot of characters that exhibit varying degrees of pride and have to sort out through a lot of problems. How about this one, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader? What do you think this one, this entire story represents? Let me give you a hint. What is the word, and for those of you that have took my metanoia classes, you're going to be cheating, so don't answer. What is the word, where do we get the word knave from in the church? The word nave. Navus, the Latin term for ship, right? And so the, it's, there's beautiful imagery in orthodoxy. In some of the churches, actually, you'll go to some churches that are actually shaped like an ark because it is supposed to be that ship that travels through the waters of life. We hear about that in the canon and in the funeral service, beholding the sea of life, raging with the storms of temptation and taking refuge in thy calm haven, I cry unto thee. Taking refuge in thy church, in thy calm haven, I cry unto thee, right? So the voyage of the Don Treader is a book describing the spiritual life. And then there's a beautiful story in that book about repentance when Eustace turns into a dragon. You remember this? And he repents of what he did. The silver chair, I was going to ask you this one, but this really talks about fighting against the powers of darkness. And in specific, there's some interesting apologetics in this book about atheism, if you remember from this book. And then what about the last one? The last battle. What do you think that one is? That's the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ. What else? Restoration of all things. Restoration of all things. What else? There's a lot in this book. What about a really beautiful... Go ahead. I was going to say, coming online, it says end of ages. End of ages? How about... Have you noticed the very vivid description it gives of heaven and hell? Yes. In that book? And the dwarfs. And the dwarfs? Okay. We're going to talk heavily about that because that's a very important image for us. So yes, the end of the world imagery and thoughts on heaven and hell. Whoop. 
Very good. Your memory serves you very well. How many of you have not, how many of you have not read those books since you were eight? <laughs> right? A couple Adams. See, I knew there was going to be one. What was that? The movies. <laughs> well. I saw the movies. Yes. Here's an interesting question for you. So the magician's nephew, let's go back to that list that I gave you. The Magician's Nephew, it was written in 1955. It's the prequel to all of these series. It's the book that chronologically in Narnia happens first. But you notice that it was the second to last one being written by C.S. Lewis. He wrote The Magician's Nephew and then The Last Battle. Why? He wanted a prequel? <laughs> he wanted more money? He wanted a prequel, she said. Why do you think he wrote... This is a guess. He didn't write, he didn't say this, but it makes sense. Yes? You kind of have to explain the beginning if you're going to talk about the end. Yes. <laughs> yes. In order to understand where we're going, we have to understand where we came from. Right? It's impossible to study the end times and Christian eschatology, this ultimate destiny of mankind, without first understanding the reason that we're here. The purpose of life. I was recently at a Christian pastor's... Um, meeting for coffee two weeks ago. Uh, it was in Linden, the city next to us. And there was all the pastors that were joining and we were talking about uh, this event that was happening in Linden called the Linden Night of Hope. And the big mega church in town, The Rock, was putting it together uh, as a way to reach out and missionize to the people that are not going anywhere. And so what they did was The Rock says, we're going to set up a, uh, a, a big stage and we're going to have some secular music. And then the pastor from The Rock is going to come and going to give a Christian message and then send him over and to visit with the ch various churches that have the booths and things like that that are local, which we had one. But one of the debates that was going on at this pastor's meeting is we're like, well, what, what Christian message are you going to preach at this, this gathering? What? And he was saying, it's going to be something that's universal, something that we all agree on. And I said, and, and he said, I'm going to speak about God's love and salvation in Christ. I'm paraphrasing, but this is kind of where this, this conversation was going. And I responded to the pastor with a rhetorical question, but it's the question that I want to frame everything with this class this tonight. And it's hoping, I'm hoping that I, it, ends, it ends up with a sit down for coffee with him uh, down in the future, which we have yet to set up, but we will. But the question that I asked him, he said, we're going to be talking about God's love and salvation in Christ. And I asked him a very pointed question. What is salvation? What does that mean to be saved? We've heard this all before, right? Has anybody ever come up to us on the street and said, are you saved? Right? Saved from what? Is it deliverance from hell? Is it redemption from sin? Because in order, and I use that first one because in order to be saved, what are you being saved from, right? Is it a penalty that's paid for mankind, for redemption, for sin? Is it union with God through theosis? What does it mean to be saved? What is salvation? And studying the beginning of the world, understanding the reasons for our existence. I'll get your questions in a minute. And that relationship that we were meant to have with the Creator in the beginning. This goes a long way in answering this question, what is salvation? And this is perhaps why C.S. Lewis wrote The Magician's Nephew right before the last battle. One right after the other. Because in order to understand where we're going, we have to understand where we came from and what we are meant here, put here to do. And then lastly, the study of cosmology, the creation of the world and mankind, it's going to give us three things, three very important things, all three of which I want to cover tonight and we're going to go through the booklet to get to. It's going to tell us the truth about God, some very interesting things to know about God, the truth about the world, and then finally the truth about mankind. So this is kind of a roadmap of where we're going to go. Okay? Question. Yes? Well, my Protestant understanding of how you saved is that you're saved um, from the judgment of God. Say, so you said your, your Protestant understanding was that you're saved from the judgment of God? Yeah. Save this for the end times eschatology class. Save that question. Okay. Save that one for the bishop because he's talking about the last judgment. Okay. <laughs> That'll be the first question and I just want to see his face whenever you ask that question. Okay. When we read the story of creation, we really do learn a lot about God, don't we? The first one is obvious and it's very important. God is completely independent of the world, right? 
So what's the first words in Scripture? Genesis 1.1. What is it? In the beginning, God created. So he's external. This is very basic stuff, right? He's external. He is self-existing. And he is the source of everything. He existed before creation. This is a hard concept for us to grasp as human beings, right? And I promise we're going to get into a discussion about time next week when we talk about the angels. But try to contemplate that sentence for just one second. God has always existed and will always exist. I brought this up with our last Metanoia class. Have you ever tried to wrap your head around the word eternity? Like just sat down and just, we'll, we'll take five seconds. And I want you to think of this. That, and I know this is, I'm, I'm stretching the, the word, the terminology here, because we really don't have a frame of reference. But think about this reality for a second. There's always going to be something next. In, in our time, if, to put it in words of temporal time, there's always going to be a tomorrow. Just sit and try to wrap your head around that for just five seconds of silence. You can't. You can't wrap your head around these types of thoughts. We're going to come back to that, I promise you. Another thing that we learn about God is He is not bound to heaven. He's not just up in heaven because He created what at the same time? He created the heavens and what? And the earth. We just sat upstairs before, Metan before, the, uh, before the class began. What do we sing? What's that beautiful hymn that we usually begin our prayers with? Who do we reach out to to ask us to help, help us to pray? We say, oh, heavenly O oh, heavenly King, we're speaking to the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present and filling all things. Yes. So he's not just up there looking down and playing with us like chess pieces, right? He is here. He's with us. He's everywhere present and he's filling all things. To sum up what we learn about God, this is where we're going to start using your book. So what I did was all of the major quotes from the saints we're going to use today, as well as the excerpts from the Chronicles of Narnia are going to be in your books. And let's look at the very first page about this quote from St. Basil the Great so we could read it together. St. Basil the Great on the greatness of God. He says, In the fear that human reasonings may make you wander far from the truth, Moses, who is the writer of Genesis, has anticipated inquiry, questions, by engraving in our hearts as a seal and a safeguard the awesome name of God in the beginning God created. It is He, beneficent nature, the beauty the most to be the desired, the origin of all that exists. It is He who in the beginning created heaven and the earth. So a very beautiful quote from St. Basil the Great. Keep your books open. So that's the truth about God. Now what about the truth of the world? Everyone who has ever attended, who has ever read or heard the creation account of Christianity from Scripture? Have we all heard Genesis 1, read through Genesis, or heard about it in church school at the very least? Okay, So I'm not going to, I didn't put it in your books because I think it's generally understood what we read in Genesis. But there are a few things that we can glean from this. First of all, Christians understand that the earth didn't come about by accident, right? Whether there was a big bang or something else really doesn't matter. Those details of how the earth was created really doesn't matter. What matters is that the creation of the wor world was dependent on the will of God. And it's very hard to argue, even with scientific advancements of our age, that there was some kind of... It's very hard to argue that there was not some kind of higher power that was responsible for creating the universe, right? Have we ever had that conversation with somebody? We've all had to have this conversation where somebody that thinks that they're very smart will come up and they'll say, you know, God didn't create the universe. It was made by protons, neutrons, and electrons, all of which converged to create a cosmic explosion which formed the universe and explains why the Milky Way is traveling 1.3 miles a second across the universe. Have we all had this conversation or maybe a variation thereof? What's our response, our, re our logical response to that? Who made the protons? Who made the protons? <laughs> Where did the neutrons and electrons come from that caused the Big Bang? I'm going to give... Well, of course. It's an impossible question to answer. One of the terms that we use, this is, a very, this is another very difficult concept to grasp for us in our human minds, and I'll explain why. But one of the words that the fathers used to describe how the world came about is this word, 
ex nihilo. And this word is translated into out of nothing. So God created the world not with protons or neutrons and electrons. He created it out of nothing. This is another thing that will blow our minds when we think about it. So when I want to make a pot of chicken soup, anything that we make is made from other matter, right? When I want to make a pot of chicken soup, which is my favorite food in the world, I have to get chicken, I have to get vegetables, I have to get the broth, I have to get water, I have to get all of these matter, all these elements and matter, and put them to create something wonderful and good. When God created the universe, he didn't take an existing proton, an existing neutron, an existing electron to put together in a soup that exploded, right? He did all of these things. He made them out of nothing, out of his head. He just spoke it. He just spoke it, and we're going to talk about that very deeply. He just spoke it. So very important. But that's really hard for us to grasp. That's a very difficult thing for us to grasp. And this is where we get a, a lot of Christian... Uh, Christian writers and theologians, they sometimes get into trouble when they try to explain concepts like that, trying to explain that which is unexplainable. This is a common problem in theology. And this is why the church, especially the Orthodox Church, strives to, to not explain everything, right? Everything doesn't have to be logically explained through reason. What do we rely on? Perfect. Experience and this word that starts with an M. Mystery. 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 It can't be explained. This is why when you ask the priest the difficult questions, he responds, it's a mystery. Don't worry about it. It's a mystery. There's a beautiful quote in that book that I'm going to read here. This is a side note, a little bit of a side note, but has anybody ever read this quote from C.S. Lewis when he's trying to, he's, he uses this quote in trying to use reasoning to explain things that are unexplainable. So this is his response to atheism. This is a wonderful quote. You could use this against anybody that argues against God. I hope that you've all read this quote before, but I'm going to read it for you. Supposing that there was no intelligence behind the universe, no creative mind, in that case, nobody designed my brain for the purpose of thinking. It's merely that when the atoms inside my skull happen for physical or chemical reasons to arrange themselves in a certain way, this gives me as a byproduct this sensation that I call thought. But if that's so, if thought is an accident, how can I trust my own thinking to be true? It would be like upsetting a milk jug and hoping that it splashes itself and gives you a map of London. But if I, could trust, if I can't trust my own thinking, of course, I can't trust the arguments leading to atheism and therefore have no reason to be an atheist or anything else. Unless I believe in God, I can't believe in thought. So I can never use thought to disbelieve God. Isn't he wonderful, right? In essence, he's saying, for those of you that, that need to read that again, in essence, C.S. Lewis, Lewis is brilliantly stating that if creation was an accident, if you were an accident, then even your thoughts, which are just random chemical occurrences in your brain, are an accident. So how can we trust an accidental thought to prove that there is not a God behind everything? Brilliant. Brilliant. In his book, Mere Christianity, who's read that book? That's a wonderful book, Mere Christianity. In his book, Mere Christianity, he poses in one of the chapters, and I believe this wholeheartedly, it's actually harder to be an atheist than it is to believe in God. It's much harder to disprove that God exists than it is to prove that God exists. Because literally, I mean, if you look outside, the truth hits us every time we walk outside. We're too busy to think about these things. But think about it. When you walk out the door, you see all of these trees on the leaves which are sucking up the carbon dioxide in the air and spitting out oxygen, right? That's a miracle in itself, right? That doesn't happen by accident. All of the individual blades of grass. You ever walked up on a, on a side of a, uh, on a walk and just picked up a blade of grass and looked closely at the detail, the little hundreds of lines, and just a piece of grass? Or on a leaf to see all of the veins and the different things. On one simple leaf, we've got 30,000 of them in the backyard. The lilies of the field, the birds of the air, the ozone layer that just happens to protect us from the sun's harmful rays. The fact that we are just far enough from the sun to not burn and also not freeze, <laughs> right? But it's all an accident. Forgive me. It's all an accident. Just reproduction itself. What? Just reproduction itself. Reproduction itself. One of life's many miracles. The fact that you're able to understand. Right, an accident. But the thing, 
the, the fact that you're even able to comprehend the words that are coming out of my mouth, which are going into your ears, which your brain is then moving around different chemicals to comprehend what I'm saying, and then for you to respond back, the same thing that's happening, it's a, a billion things going on. We don't take the time to just sit and think about these things. All right, let's pull out a little bit of some Chronicles of Narnia. So when we read through Genesis, we also learn that the creation of the world was done in a very specific order. And this is where I hope we could take our first dive and answer some questions from the Chronicles of Narnia as the magician's nephew uh, in its description of creation, the creation of Narnia. So the main characters of this book, just to give you a quick re recap in case it's been some time that you have read. Did, did everybody get a chance to read this before the class? In case you've forgotten, and for those of them, those that are online, the main characters of this book are a boy named Diggory and his friend Polly, okay? And they happen to stumble in a room where Diggory's uncle Andrew, who was a magician of sorts, was performing some very strange experiments involving some magic rings. This is why it's called the magician's nephew, right? And every time somebody would put on one of these rings, it would teleport whoever wore them outside of this world and put them into a forest. And there were all kinds of different pools of water in the forest, and each of those different pools left to a di led to a different world or a different type of existence. Is this all ringing a bell for you? Yes? So the first world that Diggory and Polly ended up going to had some really bad vibes to it. It was described as a dark, quiet, and empty place called Charn, and Diggory ends up waking up the evil witch whose name is, does everybody remember? Jadis. Jadis. Ends up waking up the evil witch named Jadis. And as the book progresses, there's a bunch of things that happen where they end up going back into London. And then eventually, Diggory, Polly, Uncle Andrew, Jadis, there's a man named Mr. Ketterly, there's a cabbie and his horse named Strawberry, they all end up in this empty world. And this is where our excerpt from the book begins. So this is at the bottom of page one in the different font there. And really it, speaking of this world, was uncommonly like nothing. There were no stars. It was so dark that they couldn't see one another at all and it made no difference whether you kept your eyes shut or open. Under their feet was a cool, flat something which might have been earth but it was certainly not grass or wood. The air was cold and dry, and there was no wind. And then in order to skip a couple paragraphs, I kind of paraphrase the next paragraphs. In the middle of the darkness, they started to hear a voice coming from all different directions. The blackness began to disappear as they saw the creation of the stars, and this voice got louder, and the sun came over the horizon to light up the darkness, and it was there that they were able to get a glimpse of the singer who was the, uh, the lion named Aslan, and here's where the book picks up. The lion was pacing to and fro about that empty land, singing his new song. It was softer and more lifting than the song by which he had called the stars and the sun, a gentle rippling music. And as he walked and sang in a valley grew greens with grass, the valleys grew green, green with grass. It spread out from the lion like a pool. It ran up the sides of the little hills like a wave, and in a few minutes it was creeping up the lower slopes of the distant mountains, making that young world every moment softer. The light wind could now be heard ruffling the grass. And soon there were other things besides the grass. The higher slopes grew dark with heather. Patches of rougher and more bristling green appeared in the valley. Diggory did not know what they were until one began coming up quite close to him. It was little, spiky thing that threw out dozens of arms and covered these arms with green and grew larger at the rate of an inch every two seconds. And there were dozens of these things all around him now. And when they were nearly as tall as himself, he saw what they were, trees, he exclaimed. There was plenty to watch and to listen to. The tree which Diggory had noticed was now full-grown beech, whose branches swayed gently above his head. They stood on cool green grass, sprinkled with daisies and buttercups. A little way off along the riverbank, willows were growing, and on the other side, tangles of flowers, lilac, wild rose, and rhododendron closed them in, and the horse was tearing up delicious mouthfuls of new grass. And all this time, the lion's song and his stately prow to and fro, backward and forward, was going on. What was rather alarming is that each turn he came a little nearer. 
Polly was finding the song more and more interesting because she thought she was beginning to see a connection between the music and the things that were happening. When a line of dark firs sprang up on a ridge about a hundred yards away, she felt that they were connected with a series of deep, prolonged notes which the lion had sung a second before. And when he burst into a rapid series of lighter notes, she was not surprised to see primroses suddenly appearing in every direction. Thus, with an unspeakable thrill, she felt quite certain that all things were coming, as she said, out of the lion's head. So let's talk about this briefly. What are some of the images, there's a lot, what are some of the images that we could talk about that C.S. Lewis is showing us about the creation of the world? Let's start with the first one. In the book, by whose word was the world created? Whose song? The lion. It was Aslan's. And in the Chronicles of Narnia, what Christian figure does Aslan represent throughout the entire series? Christ. The figure of Christ. But wait a minute, Father Gabriel. Jesus wasn't there at the time of creation. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, he was. The fathers understood this. Scripture tells us that it was the second person of the Trinity, the Word, the Logos, the capital W, Word of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, who was the person of the Trinity that literally spoke the world into existence out of his head. Ex nihilo, just like the lion, right? And where do we read about this in Scripture? First John. First John. In fact, in this church, we read this in a bunch of different languages. The first five verses that we read on Pascha at night, John John 1, verses 1 through 5. I'm going to read it for you. And if you've never read it before, understanding that the person, the word that they're talking about is Christ, read it and hear it with that being said. Yes? Are you going to say it in Russian? No, I'll say it in English. I'll say it in English. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. You see this connection, this beautiful connection that C.S. Lewis kind of plays in showing that it was Aslan. It was the second person of the, the Trinity that created the earth that we live in today. All right, here's a big question. This is a good time to answer this. Why? Why did God create the world? Did he have to create the world? What do you think? No. So why? What's he getting out of this? Right? What is he getting out of this? Anybody want to take a guess before we answer it? Actually, if you just read that next sentence on the slide, because I forgot to do the animation, you could read... This is a standard Orthodox Christian response for why the world was created, and a lot of fathers speak about this, so that other beings, us, glorifying him, might be participants in his goodness. I want to touch on that word goodness here. We hear this term goodness in creation, especially developed in Psalms. So what's the Psalm that we read before Vespers? Anybody know? Psalm 10. Three, bless the Lord of my soul, O Lord my God, thou art very great. And what does it go on to describe? The creation of the world. The creation, right? The creation. Calling upon all of these reasons why we need to glorify God and his existence. St. Theodoret, Theodoret writes in that next quote in your book, The Lord God has no need of anyone to praise him, but by his goodness alone... He granted existence to angels, archangels, and the whole creation. God has need of nothing. You answered that question already. God has need of nothing, but he, being an abyss of goodness, deigned to give existence to the things which did not exist. So why did God create the world? To allow us to participate in his goodness, in his divine life. Yeah, but that doesn't explain how, why he created the animals. And... It, it will in a second when we get to the creation of animals through C.S. Lewis. Yes. 
So this is the motive for creation. It's the very reason for our entire existence. So how we decide to accept and grow this incredible gift that we've been given determines where, what direction we are moving in towards life. Are we living our lives contrary to what we were created to be, which is to glorify God and His goodness, to worship Him and everything? Are we living our lives contrary to that calling? Or are we living with Him and growing in that gift that He has given mankind? So keep this in mind, because this is really going to feed into some thoughts that we have later on on heaven and hell. But I wanted to at least touch on it, uh, touch on it today. Yes? Did you say that the quote uh, that was St. Theodoret is, is in there. Yes, it's the one uh, on next page, on page... Oh, I didn't put it in there. Okay, I, I will send it to you. I'm sorry. Okay, that's, that's the fine. one I missed. Thank I will send it to you, yes. Okay. Let's continue reading about the progression of the creation of Narnia. So in the book, we're now giving, getting to the point that Dennis was asking for where living creatures are now being created. But before all of that happens, I wanted to point out this one short paragraph by C.S. Lewis in regards to Uncle Andrew who is sitting there with them, witnessing all of these things, right? It says, in a few minutes, does everybody, uh, it's on page three. <clears throat> in a few minutes, Diggory came to the edge of the wood, where he, where the, and there he stopped. The lion was singing still, but now the song had once more changed. It was more like what we would call a tune, but it was far wilder. It made you want to shout. It made you want to rush at other people and either hug them or fight them. It made Diggory hot and red in the face, and it had some effect on Uncle Andrew, for Diggory could hear him saying, A spirited gel, sir. It's a pity about her temper, but a damn fine woman all the same. A damn fine woman. So it's interesting to point out. Yes? I think he's saying gel. Like how like it was, say girl. Yeah. Gel. Yeah. I thought you said you weren't going to swear. Yeah. You know what? In the book that I had, it was D-E-M, because I copied that. I, thought, I was wondering what that was, because I thought he was like doing a... a, a yes. It's a spirit... Well, it's a spirited gal, sir. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. But at the end, a dem fine woman is what right. he had said. Yes. Oh, so you weren't questioning that. You were saying... Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Spirited gal. Girl. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. You corrected me. It is spelled like gel, and I do buy that for my hair. <laughs> so when I see that word, that's what I see. He's got an accent. Right. A damn fine woman. Yes, yes. But it's interesting. Think about this paragraph for a second. So who is, Jade, who is Jadis, Jadis? Who is she supposed to represent in this entire story? What allegorical reference is she representing? Who? The devil, right? All of these things are going around in Uncle Andrew. This amazing creation and all these beautiful things are happening. And where's his focus? <laughs> On the witch. On the witch. <laughs> on the devil. On something unrelated to the goodness that's happening all around him, right? Isn't this a beautiful, not, isn't this a horrible picture of our own existence sometimes in life, right? We're surrounded daily by creation and beauty and simplicity. Not even in just, I mean, in winter, there is some beauty there, but most of the time it's pretty ugly. But we're still surrounded by people. The beauty and the goodness that is found in other people. We're surrounded by all of this, and yet where is our focus on? So, Not so much on that all the time, but on the things of this world. On our cell phones, on our bank accounts, on distracting us from what we should be appreciating every single day. And this is why the church... Yes? Huh? Did they say Michigan football is in there? Michigan football is in there. It's a distraction. It's a horrible distraction. <laughs> That's coming from a Buckeye fan. This is coming from a Buckeye fan. And now everybody has the mass exodus and walks out. <laughs> Forgive me, yes. Number four in the country. Thank you very much. <laughs> so this is about temptation. Yes, he was right. tempted. Right. But, but, uh, but so who is singing the song? Was it Jada singing the song? No. So Aslan in the book is, is still singing the song. And, 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 and all of the creation is popping up, but this Uncle Andrew, Jadis is just standing there. She, they really don't describe what she's doing at that moment, at least in this moment of the book. And he's just kind of focused on her, not on everything else that's going on. And there's kind of a little image that I stole from one of the, the books of, of him just kind of being in reverence to her for the entire book. And throughout the early part, he never saw any of the bad things that she was doing to him, right? He always just praised her and praised her and praised her. This is the, it's a damn fine woman, you know, it's a wonderful woman. So and the temptation was he was observing her when 
not listening to the song. He was observing yeah, he was too focused on, 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 on the devil. Yeah, the question was, was, it was, it was a clarification that he was just observing her and not everything that was going around him. Yes. And this is a small reason. This is one of the reasons why if we go through the whole cycle of services in the church, like the monastics, they read a lot of psalms that talk about creation, especially the first six psalms of Matins, which is the service you would do in the morning, has some beautiful references to creation. And then at the end of the day, you begin, your, you begin the day appreciating things in creation, and then you end the day at Vespers, speaking once again about creation in the psalms. These constant reminders that the church gives us to not focus on the devil. Focus on life. Focus on our Lord. Focus on everything that he has done for us. All of these wonderful works. And now the big part of this. Let's, go, let's continue to read. And it's on the, uh, where are we at? On page, page three, yes. The creation of the Narnians. Can you imagine... A stretch of grassy land bubbling up like a water pot? For that is really the best description of what is happening. In all directions, it was swelling into humps. There were very different sizes, some no bigger than molehills, some as big as wheelbarrows, two the size of cottages, and the humps moved and swelled until they burst, and the crumpled earth poured out of them, and from each hump there came out an animal." The moles came out just as you might see a mole come out in England. The dogs came out barking the moment that their heads were free and struggling as you might see them do when they are getting through a narrow hole in a hedge. And now you could hardly hear the song of the lion. There was so much cawing, cooing, crowing, braying, neighing, baying, barking, lowing, bleeding, and trumpeting. And far overhead from beyond the veil of the blue sky which hid them, the stars sang again. A pure cold, difficult music. And then there came a swift flash like fire, but it burnt no one, either from the sky or from the lion itself. And every drop of blood tingled in the children's bodies, and the deepest, wildest voice that they had ever heard was saying, Narnia, 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 awake, love, think, speak, be walking trees, be walking beasts, be divine waters. Okay, let's unpack this a little bit. So mankind, we know, is God's highest creation, right? Mm -hmm. So at the beginning of Genesis, we read, then God said, let us, why does he say let us? The Trinity. The Trinity. Three persons of the Trinity. Let us, meaning the triune God, make man in our image and according to our likeness. And then in the second chapter of Genesis, we get a few more important details about man's creation. God formed man out of the dust from the ground and breathed in his face the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Okay? So, so, so wait, aren't animals a living soul? Ah, we're going to talk about that right now. So like the creation, he asked if animals have a soul. And I'm going to answer that right now. So like all of creation, like all of the talking, Narnia, uh, talking animals of the Chronicles of Narnia, where did all those talking animals come from? Where did they come from? The ground. The ground. From the mud, from the dust, right? And God created the existence of man from what? From the ground, from the dust of the ground, right? Just like what we saw with the, with the talking animals in the Chronicles of Narnia. But what made those talking animals unique? What happened after that? They talked. Well, they talked, but what happened after it? So after it came from the ground, what then happened? There was a swift flash like fire. From where? Aslan. From Aslan. From Aslan, from the sky, yeah. right? And that was God, of course, if we look at it from a, from a human perspective, this was God breathing the breath of life, which is known to the Christian understanding as the soul. Okay? The Holy Spirit, the soul, yes. But I'm saying the breath of life, but this is, this is the divine... Oh, I'll get to this in a second. I'll, I'll explain it right now. So it's fascinating to understand that each and every one of us, all of us that have ever come before us, all that will ever come, the baby that is conceived in the womb, all of them are made up of a combination of both the material and the spiritual, yes. From the earth and from beyond, something that is divine and comes from God. 
And so we're literally this organic union of heaven and earth ourselves, right? We have some divine attributes that make up our image, which we're going to talk about next. We're a combination of the material and the spiritual. And there's a very beautiful uh, picture of this. Has anybody ever seen this icon? Oh, no. Yes. Endowing him, dowing man with soul. So towards the beginning of this class, I shared a question that I wanted to ask that pastor friend of mine, and now I'm going to offer the orthodox answer. What is salvation? Salvation is the journey to becoming a true human being. Most Christian traditions, not all, but some of them have some kind of teaching on the importance of those two parts of us, the body and the soul, okay? Okay. And the difference, is what, the difference that we find is what parts of those teachings are emphasized. So in the Orthodox Church, we have a very important distinction that there is to be made between these two words, being made in God's image and being made in God's likeness. And it's the image of God, this is the divine part, the part that comes from God. This is what makes us unique from animals. It's a soul, right? The divine part that comes from above. Animals don't have that which is why we don't all say all dogs go to heaven. I'm sorry. I know that comes as a shock for a lot of you. But don't the animals have spirits? You can ask the archbishop that question. <laughs> <laughs> not like humans. Not like us. No, not like In us, no way. But there is talk about, you know, and, and when we get to the, the, the end times and talk about the transfiguration of the world, you know, it's different. It's hard to explain. I'll get to that because I have just a couple more things to cover in this class. That's coming. And if I don't answer it properly or, or, or to your satisfaction, ask his eminence the next day. Yes. Do dogs go to heaven? And that's another one. I want to see his face when I'm sitting in the back. I'm kidding. No, he'll, he'll answer it really, really wonderfully. But we do have this emphasis on the importance, this distinction of the image and likeness. So I wanted to look at some of the attributes that we have as humans that differentiates us and things that we get from God that differentiate us from the animals. So let's look at the first one. Huh? You walk on two feet? Well, no, apes do that. Apes do that. So let's look at the first one, rationality. So we as human beings have the ability to reason, right? We can make complex decisions based off of a variety of factors that are thrown at us. And this is one of the reasons, because we have the ability to reason logically, this is why we have the crowning place in creation, right? This is why we're able to rule over other life forms that don't have this type of rationality. Where we sometimes get into trouble is we allow the world to rule over us, as opposed to us ruling over the world. I could, that, there's a whole class in that one paragraph. There is, but I'm, I'm going to move on. Freedom. This is a big one. This is one of those divine attributes that we receive from God. The freedom to choose what we want, whether it's good or bad. Why did God give us this freedom? So he knew at the beginning of time, because he's, he, he knows all, right? He knows all things. He knew that as soon as he put Adam and Eve together, they were going to screw up, right? He knew it. He knew this was going to happen. He knew that there was going to be wars on the earth and there was going to be murder and there was going to be sin and people were going to be falling away. Why not just make Adam and Eve, why not give them all these other nice attributes but freedom, we're going to control them a little bit. Why wouldn't he do that? I'm going to ask that, I'm going to answer that question with another question. Why did God create man? What was his purpose? To do what? To worship him and to love him to participate in his life. If I came up to poor Conrad and I said, say the words that you love me with a gun pointed to your head. When you say I love you, unless you're a really, really solid, deeply spiritual Christian, if I'm holding a gun to your head and say that, say that you love me, those words that are coming out of your mouth are very forced, right? They're not genuine. You're being forced to say these things. The only way that we could truly love somebody and love God is through freedom. So this is the reason. Forced love, of course, is not love. Okay? And Father, I would say that it's really, you know, sobering to know that it was all worth it to him, knowing everything that would happen, right. so that he could have that kind of a love relationship with us. With us, yeah. There's some depth there. 
there's some depth. So let's go through a couple more of these ones. A conscience, okay. We have a sense, because of the image of God within us, of what is right and what is wrong. We have the freedom, however, to choose whether to follow our conscience or to quiet it, right? Do we? Yes, we have the freedom to choose. I just got well, that. As sinners, we really don't have the uh, option of not saying Yes, we do. Our, our th the, the most blessed Theotokos was somebody that led a sinless life. Christ did not sin, and he was full, fully man, yes. Yeah. We have the ability to walk towards that divine life fully right here today, if we chose to, to follow our conscience. Like Jiminy Cricket, let our conscience be our guide. We never do that. We never do that. And then here's a fun one. Like God, it is in our nature to do good, to spread goodness. I'm going to prove this all to you right now. How many of you, whenever you do something selfless for somebody, get the warm fuzzies? Yes? How often have you said, I got more out of that than they did? Right? Right? This is because it is in your core to be a good person, to do good for others, to be completely selfless. This is why that's such a natural, wonderful feeling for us. It's bliss for us. Right? I skipped one. The desire to be communal. So just like the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, always together as one. We too were created to always be together and inseparable. Men is communal by nature. We're meant to be with others. Now you'll ask me, what about those hermits that go out into the desert and they're by themselves praying and praying? Who are their companions? Our Lord, the saints. Yes, the saints, the angels, the archangels. So man is designed to be communal. You were thinking that word. Were you thinking that when you, th that question? Or you laughed. Well, no, I was thinking about, uh, I, I must be a huge sinner because I'd rather be just left alone. Oh. <laughs> You'd rather be with the saints. You'd rather be with the saints, yeah. not left alone. No, no. <laughs> Yes, saints, yes, yes. So, of course, these are just a few. These are just a few, but there's a lot of different attributes that we have. So, real quickly, I just have... I want to define this term really quickly. Now, I could go into five semesters on this one word alone, but I'm going to try to cover it in the next two minutes, okay? To say... Yeah, uh, this, this quote is not, and, and I, I, I could get it to you online. This is, this is a late one, but it was very good. To say that the image of God in the soul of mankind is what man was created to be, it is his likeness that we spend our existence trying to grow in. So we're given the image at the beginning. Our life is meant to grow into that image, right? To continue to follow our conscience, to be more communal, to, to do good and participate in goodness. So we spend our existence trying to per perfect ourselves through virtue and holiness to become like God. Lowercase g, right? In a process that I'm, heard, I'm sure that most of you have heard this term, theosis, union with God. And C.S. Lewis actually, even being a non-Orthodox, understood this concept very clearly. This is a quote from his book, Mere Christianity. And I'm sorry it's not in your worksheet, but I, I wrote it down here. He says, the command, be ye perfect, is not just idealistic gas, nor is it a command to do the impossible. He is going to make us into creatures that can obey that command. He said in the Bible that we were gods, and he is going to make good on his words only if we let him. If we choose, we can make the feeblest and filthiest of us into a god or goddess, dazzling, radiant, immortal creatures, pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine. A bright, stainless mirror which reflects back to him perfectly through a smaller scale, his boundless power and delight and goodness. The process will be long, and in parts it will be very painful. But that is what we are in for. Nothing less. He meant what he said. It's a beautiful quote, kind of describing for us this thought of theosa. So the purpose of our existence is to grow in the likeness of God. And this is why I said at the very beginning when we started this, 
Salvation is the process of becoming a human being. We're called in this life to remember and acknowledge God as our creator, to glorify him, to rejoice and grow in union with him, and to live in him. And you notice in your books, I think I put it in there, that beautiful quote from the wisdom of Sirach. Is it in there? It's not in there. I'll give it to you right now. Sirach 17, 6 through 10. He filled them with knowledge and understanding. He set his eye on their hearts to show them the majesty of his works. And they will praise his holy name to proclaim the grandeur of his works. So a beautiful little thing in there about. And finally, this was a beautiful quote. And I hope you all picked it up when you read it for the first time. This is what happens when we don't live up to the image that we were created to be. When we deny that gift that differentiates us from the rest of the animals. So let's look at our last uh, excerpt from Chronicles of Narnia for tonight. It's a word of warning from Aslan. So in The Magician's Nephew, Aslan ends this creation account by giving a word of warning to the talking animals, which were meant to represent us, right? To the talking animals that he gave reason. And allegorically, if you kind of listen to this, pretend that he's almost talking to us, giving these words of warning to us. He says, Creatures, I give you yourselves, said the strong, happy voice of Aslan. I give you forever this land of Narnia. I give you the woods, the fruits, the rivers. I give you the stars, and I give you myself. The dumb beasts who I have chosen are yours also. Treat them gently and cherish them, but don't go back to their ways, lest you cease to be talking beasts. For out of them you were taken, and into them you can return. Do not so. Everybody get the, the little heebie-jeebies here? You know, yes, a little bit. I'll close with this beautiful quote from St. Basil the Great in his homily on Genesis 1.1. He calls upon us all by saying, let us glorify the superb artist who created the world most wisely and skillfully and from the beauty of that which is visible, let us understand him who surpasses all in beauty. And then in speaking of, our, uh, speaking of our own existence as mankind, St. Basil says, from the majesty of these sensible and limited bodies, let us make a conclusion regarding him, God, who is endless, who surpasses every majesty, and then the multitude of his power surpasses every understanding. So some very beautiful, thought-provoking quotes from St. Basil the Great. And I did it in an hour. That's exactly what I was shooting for. So very good. Um, there's a lot that we covered. There's a lot that we have yet to cover. Next week, I'm hoping to get into the invisible creation. So we'll read through not only some excerpts from the Chronicles of Narnia. Who has ever read Mother Alexandra's book on the holy angels? Yes? Yeah. This is the, the monastic who I think is, is one of these days going to be destined for sainthood uh, that founded the Holy Transfiguration Monastery in uh, Elwood City, Pennsylvania, and also uh, the sister monastery to that, which was founded from Holy Transfiguration, is Holy Dormition Monastery. So in a way, she's kind of like the mother of both monasteries. She has a very amazing experience of angels. I would, we'll read it together next week, so you don't have to spoil it there. Uh, we'll also talk about what angels are, and then in that, we're going to talk about the fall of Lucifer which has some interesting things, which will really set us up nicely for our last class together before the bishop comes, this study of heaven and hell. So we'll talk more about evil and those things next week. Very good? Any, any, any questions? Yes, thank God. Adam. Would you like to do questions? Or try to this well, class? does anybody have any questions? Or you can ask me also personally later, or if there's anybody online that has a question, I can answer that too. Huh? Call you. you call me, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Give me a chance to think, yes. So, um, I suppose that it's kind of a gray area. You know, there's, you'll hear some people say one thing and some people say another thing about the salvation of animals. Um, and, you know, if you ask, you know, do dogs go to heaven? That's, I think it's kind of a loaded term because, like, what do you mean by heaven? And Because I obviously, I, you know, I would side with the church and say, yeah, we don't. You know, animals aren't the same as people. They don't have, and they're not made in the likeness of God like we are. Um, well, what, let me let's answer this question. Let me let me just jump in real quick. Why would why would somebody in the Orthodox Church say 
that animals don't go to heaven. What is heaven? Right, well, they're not, they can't achieve theosis, right, in the same way that a person could. Right. They don't okay. have that like, image and likeness of God. So in that sense, yeah, of course, animals don't go to heaven. But I think you touched on it a little bit, so I'm not sure that you even disagreed with it in your statements. But, you know, I heard someone say once that, you know, God doesn't create to destroy. No. That, you know, that the whole world will be resurrected, including the animals even if they don't go to heaven, so to speak. Okay, so if animals are, here's another thing that you can throw out. He's, asking, he's talking about the, the, do dogs go to heaven, okay? Let's say that creation is transfigured. So let's say that when we do get to heaven, we are going to see, we, we will see dogs and cats and all of creation. Yes, this will be, this will be a transfigured part of creation. But are we going to see Fluffy, <laughs> that cat, or that particular dog? Yes. Are they individual persons, or are they just animals, part of creation? And you know, that beautiful answer that I gave you. Whoosh, it's a mystery. Right? So, so they, but they're not, they don't, they don't go to and experience heaven the same way we do. I guess would be the answer to that. that. Right, yeah. right. So therefore, so, so they have no souls, right? Right. Okay. Yes, animals, <laughs> do, animals do not have a soul. I that yes. asked me to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> God, you know, so much. Nothing really dies. It's it's because God created it. And I believe that animals have spirits, and I believe that plants have spirits also. But you're getting into a gray area, you know, and that there's not there's not specific doctrines that speak to this because the the the, the Christian church is about mankind's salvation, right? Yeah. We're not talking about the salvation of That's true. Yeah. That's so there's not, you know, that's a, how, what it's going to look like when we die. There's a lot of people that will speculate and say, well, this will happen and this will happen. But the, the, the truth of the matter is, it's a big question mark and how that experience is. But, um, but um, God created everything so it works together and the animals are intelligent and they... Um... <laughs> but do they have a soul? No. <laughs> this is where you get into that, that, that that area, you know. And, and these, are good, these are great questions, but we'll, we'll talk more about this when we talk about the new creation in a couple weeks, yeah. And I'll get some more, I'll add some more into the class about that particular topic for you. And then if I don't answer your questions, again, the bishop will be there next week. And he's the guy we have to ask the difficult Q&A for, so. Good? Yes? Why do we not hear the question, do all dogs go to hell? <laughs> <laughs> Because heaven and hell are the same place. So it's, it's just experienced in different ways. But we'll talk more about that. We'll talk more about that. So, well, thank you, everybody. And thank you for everybody online. So God willing, we will see you all next week. Again, Compline will be at 6. The class will begin at 6.30. And again, next week, we'll talk about angels, uh, the entrance of evil into the world, into the universe. Yes. You could take these home with you, or you can leave them here. If you, are, if you do take them home, just make sure you bring them back. I only made... 30 copies, yes. So if I need more next week, I can make more. So thank you, everybody. It's expensive. Yes. Yeah. We'll finish with our prayer here really quickly. The icon is over here on the wall. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. It is truly me to bless you, O Theotokos, ever Virgin Mary, and the Mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, and more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim. Without defilement you gave birth to God the Word. True Theotokos, we magnify you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to Jesus Christ. Glory.